If we're going to get to Mars, we're going to have to clear the maps. The dragons, cyclops and other monsters of the mind must be killed and the siren exposed for the fraud she is. The Interplanetary Podcast. The exploration of space for the benefit of all humankind. Your hosts in England, Rob Annabel and Matt Russell. Deluded it. Dude, dude, oh, oh yeah, yeah Robert Zubrin. Zubrin is the <laughs> Zubermeister. Bobby Z. There was another Midlands accent that you just heard there. I'm joined on the podcast by Rob, Hello. one of the Spodcats, as promised last week. Hello, Matt. Well, obviously, Rob, you're an old hand at this now. You've done a couple. Well, I've done about that. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and then that will sort of tie in with what the episode's all about. Sure. Okay, so uh, my name is Rob Annable. I'm an architect based in the UK and practice in the Midlands. Uh, I run an architecture practice that specialises in housing mostly, and I also teach at the Birmingham School of Architecture. And I uh, just have a personal interest in interplanetary topics. Um, child of the shuttle era, so that's partly to blame. Um, you have to be a bit of a nerd to be an architect, so it's a natural fit in terms of an interest in science technology. Uh, but also, I suppose that some of the discussions and uh, details around interplanetary habitation and the science technology involved with it is sort of an extreme version of the very topics that you discuss in terrestrial architecture about sort of closed systems of energy, uh, material science, and um, sort of an extreme discussion around what it is to, to dwell and to uh, be in a in, in habitation um, and think about the environment. So that plus becoming a listener to this podcast over the last couple of years um, provided inspiration to get more involved and do some reading and research. Well, I mean, you are the perfect co-host for this. This is, this is all about space habitats. And I know that, um, for example, the Fred Sharman interview that we had a couple of years ago, that came via Rob, via the Discord. Fred's a sort of long-time, uh, long-time internet friend and fellow architect with similar generations. Um, so it's a pleasure to uh, to be able to introduce him to the to the podcast. Um, and he, he continues to be sort of the, one of the most interesting thinkers and writers in this field from my, my profession's point of view, uh, and a big influence, I think, certainly on me. I love the book that you recommended, Fred's book, and but I also really liked his little piece that's in the Design Museum, Trip to Mars. Yeah book which is which is one of my favorite books i'm so i'm so often when i go to exhibitions i um and are about buying the expensive book at the end and i'm um and about that one thank thank goodness i yeah, bought it fantastic <laughs> fantastic publication and, and some, some of the some of the things that fred raises in that um uh in that essay that he wrote and uh we'll, we'll touch on some of his his work later on as well i think some of the things he raises are sort of um one of the key interests and things that I've been trying to grapple with over the last couple of years around how often the, um, uh, the, 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 the space architecture community does or doesn't engage with architectural history. And what I've found uh, by when looking at papers and research over the last couple of years, uh, I've often been surprised at how often people involved in this, in this field uh, seem to always just default to the complete sort of fresh start tabula rasa when it comes to talking about habitation and design uh, and don't seem to lean on the history of terrestrial architecture very much. So what, you, what you'll have seen in that Fred Sharman article in the Mars design, uh, the, the Mars exhibition booklet is him using his experience in architectural history and theory and, uh, and using that as a framework to, to critique and think about uh, interplanetary and habitation. Um, so we have sort of similar interests in that respect. It's impossible for us to look at this stuff and not think about architectural history here on earth and how it applies. Well, why do you think that is? Why do you think that people haven't are, are reticent to think about that, or, or or why do you think they've forgotten? Is it because it's dominated by engineers? Possibly, possibly. There's a, there's a long history of that, and 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 in certain texts and books, you'll see that there's been brief occasions where somebody from the design field, with a capital D, or architecture, industrial design, has been involved. Um, it tends to be sort of engineering led, I guess. Um, but I, I think, as you know, as we touch on in the interview later. Uh, there's a, a perhaps sometimes a lack of thinking about the sort of the metaphysics of it in a sense mm. about what it is to exist in these spaces uh, beyond just the uh, the raw uh, facts about what it takes to survive to su to subsist in that environment uh, so uh, yeah I, I'm, I might be doing huge swathes of the sector a disservice there by saying that <laughs> but certainly in the last couple of years of reading it's it's been a thought that's often come to my mind about how often things 
could be improved on by referring to existing architectural history. Let's dive straight in. We've covered how humans get to Mars and uh, in last week, and, and this is how you would actually stay on Mars, really, this week, how you actually build habitats that that grow and because you know all the things that we've talked about like uh, von braun and zubrin's mars direct are landing in a spaceship living in a spaceship they're not they're not starting to build a city but that's what we're kind of talking about here isn't it really yeah it is and the, the mars society this year has progressed onto that and we'll, we'll come on to that in recent competition and that's brought extra challenges to the table i think talking about city scale thinking mm. but in some respects the sort of mars direct um body of work which is an incredible piece of work that was hugely influential mm. for, for many years and uh, it's still sort of the touchstone, I think, for many people when it comes to thinking about Mars missions. Uh, a lot of the discussion and reading around that topic always, often seems to focus, again, on just the hard maths of getting there. Mm. How many launches, how many kilograms do you need to get there and back? Um, how many trips does that take? How do you land it? Uh, and they really seem to touch on the uh, the more complex cultural and social stuff. Yeah, that is odd, isn't it? And and because let's face it, you can't you can't do it without that. It's it's not at scale, not not no. not at scale. Uh, so well, it, it it doesn't make any sense almost to 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 even think about it without having this as the long term goal. So what I want to do is first define the problem. Because I, you know, some of the I know a lot of our listeners know what the problem is with Mars, but the the problem really is the same as the Moon, isn't it? You know, you've got the need for radiation protection. That's that's huge. I don't think we realise just how lucky we are on the Earth yeah. having a big fat, yeah. you know, big fat atmosphere <laughs> soaking it all up. Um, but radiation protection is definitely something that's that's probably worse than people think it is because we've been stuck in low earth orbit for so long and that's protected by the van allen belts you know yeah. that's 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 not even out there in the proper hardcore space um then you've got the lack of gravity and that's a complete unknown i mean that 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 for me is is it's incredible how we just don't know whether even a small amount of gravity solves the problem it's interesting to describe it as a as a challenge, though, because architecturally speaking, it, there might be some benefits to it from a mm. that loads on the structure and what you can achieve. I don't know that I've seen many examples of people experimenting with high rise ideas for interplanetary habitation, but structural opportunities because there's uh, greater ability for um, the structure to respond to um, to less load through it because of that reduced gravity. Something mm. that might be a benefit as well. But I guess you're not building with such pristine materials, are you? Um, in, well, I guess in most of the cases you see that, that of course, ISRU and the use of existing uh, material is a key part of that. So the manufacturing process might be flawed, perhaps. The 3D printing developments that are going on now and the level of control required over those materials actually could, could precisely deliver that. And a lot of 3D printing work and uh, research on Earth examines how the pre precision in 3D printing can deliver a really efficient structure, explicitly go for maximum efficiency and reduction in material quantity. So those two things combined, less gravity and absolute precision in, in structural design could be a, a benefit maybe. Yeah, additive manufacturing, yeah, yeah it's incredible. We've got poisonous regolith, I think, <laughs> the, the perchlorates in the regolith. Again, there's, there's, a, there's a plus side to that in that perchlorates are obviously quite useful for things like explosives and solid rocket propellants yeah, and things yeah not great you've got extreme cold <laughs> like all the time yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's not good and of course what do you do about your energy the sunlight that you get out at mars is nothing like the sunlight that you get on earth although there's less atmosphere but still but dust storms dust storms is, is a problem yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah dust storms is a problem but you don't get you don't get really cloudy days, so yeah, true. You no, know, true. You get maybe a couple of years of sunshine every day. Yeah, where well, you say sunshine, but obviously mm. <laughs> not exactly ideal. So we talked about the three D printed habitat challenge on podcast one four seven. We kind of went into that in depth, but I thought it was worth covering again because I think the main part of this episode is going to be about the recent Mars Society 
entries. But this one was a very major kind of program, wasn't it? The 3D printed Habitat Challenge by NASA was one of their centennial challenges, and it was to build 3D printed habitats for deep space exploration. And of course, that did kind of centre on Mars and the Moon. Yeah, and an inter- interesting structure to the competition as well, with its with its well, over several phases, focusing on different qualities, mm. which I thought was very interesting because it resulted in a three stage PR exercise, in which mm. communication about these outcomes um, covered different topics and different outcomes. Yeah, and they 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 put their money where their mouth was. They put three point one five million dollars into it, so this you know it's a nice little competition. Obviously, no one's expecting that they're going to actually build these things, but it's a good competition to be involved in. And the phase one was one of my was I remember this being like an amazing breakthrough idea, the ice house. Yeah, beautiful, really interesting project. Yeah, because you've got this building where you make it out of ice. I guess it's a bit like the Inuits and the igloo isn't it yeah. it's, it seems like an impro- improbable structure but actually it's just about the cleverest structure you can have in that environment yeah it's a really interesting project this i mean first of all it looked beautiful yeah. the, the, the internal space is its position on the landscape and the way it, the, the way it reflected the light in the renders looked absolutely fantastic i thought it was really interesting because it tackled that question of regolith challenges poisonous mm-hmm. regolith by simply avoiding it mostly so a lot of projects in the past have relied on the use of regolith either through compression and um, brick arches or rammed regolith and also reusing it for 3D printing. But this one just sort of dispensed with that and focused on ice instead, which, which was really interesting. It integrated the whole system into the lander itself. So when you look at the diagrams for that, it's got a really smart, efficient looking process where the initial structure unfolds from the lander itself and that becomes mm. the core of the house. But one of my interests in it was really to touch on what I talked about at the start, about this idea that sort of interplanetary design and thinking really exposes architectural thinking in its most extreme sense, is that that project succeeds through recognising that the layers and the thresholds from outside to in, from the Martian atmosphere to the space inside, have to be so tightly controlled. In terrestrial architecture, that's actually a device that we talk about and think about a lot, that the threshold, the boundary between you and the space you were before, that difference is how we express quality and experience in good architecture. So so as a device, understanding the threshold is quite an important part of, of my profession. It's something I talk about a lot with my students. And what you have in that, that ice house competition is is it's all about the threshold. It takes the, the airlock, that really extreme threshold, and expands it around the building in a sense because it has these two layers that you move through um, mm. where you've clearly moved from one environment into another that's slightly moderated and changed again before you finally arrive in the central central location, protected away from that uh, Martian environment. So yeah, a good example of how architectural thinking around thresholds uh, becomes a critical part of that, that system. Yeah, it almost reminded me of somehow being a little tiny man uh, sort of walking through double glazing. Yeah, that's precisely, <laughs> so that's precisely could... what it is. It's just a, a very <laughs> large double glazing system. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, but I love the I love the way that the sort of robot inside crawled around spraying water, and 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 it's it's that understanding, isn't it, that the lack of atmospheric pressure and the temperature means that water just instantly turns into ice. There's no waiting for it, yeah. so you can spray ice onto 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 walls. So it's, it's it would seem that it's probably quite a feasible technology to build with, and it certainly seems like in the um, examples they've shown, they did. Uh, one-to-one experiments doing that, and that seemed pretty, uh, pretty impressive and convincing. So it clearly has some merit. And uh, the common theme, of course, in a lot of these um, uh, projects is is a level of automation, and mm. that's that's the technology in terms of control and precision that, uh, that over the last I don't know probably 10, 15 years has really started to change this paradigm. In a sense, that reliance on automation, and you'll see it through other entries uh, in these phases coming up as well. Uh, be it through 3D printing or some sort of landscape adjustments through through mini rovers, in a sense. Yeah. Well, well, Jeff Bezos is going to have um, quite a, a lead there, isn't he? Because the automated Amazon warehouses. I mean yeah. that 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 must be a stack of data right there. Absolutely. That's yeah. Pretty yeah, pretty yeah. useful yeah. for for, yeah. for doing stuff like this. Yeah. yeah, it seems key. And and uh, the second phase. Uh, uh, 
uh, winner, the Foster and Partners um, submission, relied on that in a very different way to prepare the ground. Some of the materials and processes for the actual habitation were more straightforward, but the um, uh, the use of uh, sort of uh, mini sojourners hmm. returning to that scale of rover, which I think is interesting as well in the in the in the current climate of demonstrating our abilities to to deliver what one and a half ton rovers or whatever it is that uh, hmm. perseverance is right now. A lot of these technologies actually return to uh, greater numbers, a sort of swarm of automation to uh, to develop these ideas. And the, the Foster and Partners one for phase two did that by preparing the ground. And so what, are the, these little tiny sojourners go round, is it called sintering, where you kind of yeah, there was, uh, heat there up? Yeah, there was sintering going on there, heating it up to bake it and make it... Uh, 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 make it solid and this is all of course connected to the discussions i think about how you manage dust when landing hmm. if you can form a, a landing pad uh, in advance that's a key part of it but the foster and partner scheme also used uh, that sort of swarm of small rovers to dig prepare and then build the regolith walls around the, their scheme as well it's incredible isn't that going back to that the, the very first von braun trip to mars and he's thinking about things like building runways and getting the ground prepared yeah. and, and it's still a thing it's still it's still there isn't it which makes you realize just how visionary von braun was i think it's actually going to be it's going to continue to be absolutely critical just just yesterday actually i saw a really interesting uh, uh nasa study on landing pads that didn't just uh look to change the condition of the ground and center it but we're experimenting with 3d printing to change the the the, the patterns on the landing pad itself to then deflect the uh, the energy from the rocket in mm. different ways to control the dust cloud like that. So you were sort of drawing a landing pad, but not just a, a com- just a circle, but it had patterns in it in order to control the flow of uh, dust, which I thought was a really interesting move as well. Well, it, presumably it's to control the flow of acoustics as well, because rocket engine noise bouncing up at your vehicle right. probably isn't the best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we tied to that too, but it, but it's 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 an intervention on the landscape. So we're making marks on the landscape in interesting and artistic ways as well in doing that. Yeah, if you look at that, well, that NASA study. We'll have to put it in the notes. But that particular NASA study, it, it was it was a beautiful pattern on the landing pad that was going to. Does, control it, does it look like? Does it look like crop circles? Does it give yeah. any any kudos to crop circles? It, it absolutely <laughs> did. Actually, yeah, I think you might be onto something there. That's that's the reason it was How? crop dust they were trying to reduce. Ah, how how incredible! Uh, and then phase three was the actual kind of uh, building up of three D ha- habitats, wasn't it? Pr- actually printing these large constructions. Yeah, so it's the the, the Marsha scheme uh, yeah. by uh, AI Space Factory. Uh, they really caught uh, the the most attention, I think, from a uh, from a communications point of view, when you could witness the uh, the three D printing competition uh, take 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 place. But some interesting stuff in here, which I was just going to say around the, the design of it itself, not just in terms of the technology, but its form and scale as well mm. uh, around the question of uh, the traditional low-lying dome or the, uh, the, the the taller structure that stands upright. Which one do you prefer, the going up or the going across? Well, the, 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 the going up move has some really interesting outcomes. And, and one of them relates back to that, that Fred Sharman piece that you mentioned at the start about how this work should try to communicate something beyond the technology. And on the website for the Marsha project, you'll see them describe the taller structure as a beacon on the landscape, mm. as opposed to just something that is sort of apologetically trying to sort of snuggle down into the landscape. And I thought just the use of that phrase alone was interesting. That it's something to suggest a more optimistic vision of the future. That this is a freestanding taller structure that stands on its own right. Uh, some interesting sort of outcomes from that around wayfinding maybe, Mm. Uh, that uh, this is a more visible structure. So back to dust storms again, maybe you can find your way home more easily on a Mm. a tall structure. Uh, But spatially, there's some interesting moves there around um, efficiencies, both in the technology to make it in the 3D printing, but also the way you move around it uh, through a vertical space and circulation efficiencies as well, Mm. uh, rather than wasting a lot of time and energy moving horizontally. Uh, you can perhaps move vertically, uh, certainly on plan, uh, take up less space to just move vertically through a space. But you have to acknowledge again that in two thirds gravity, moving up downstairs is certainly less work on the on the knees and back than it is at home. Well, you must get your exercise in. Yeah. Let's face it, people travel around the world to see 
tall buildings, don't they? Mm. People go around the world to see the Burj Khalif because it's the because it's <laughs> tallest tall. building, yeah. and or, or the Empire State Building, you know. And it's it because because it's tall, they don't go and <laughs> see. Well, I'm, I know some people do, and and, and I love things like <laughs> bunkers and stuff like that. Yeah. But there's I you know that. But on the whole, people are drawn to those kind of buildings, aren't they? Yeah, they are. I mean, there's, there's usually some discussion about the fact that most towers are designed by men. Mm-hmm. But, um, <laughs> and and rockets. Uh, well, course. yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's, the, it's the same criticism. I mean, it's probably quite fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we, the marsh is quite interesting, isn't it? Because um, they actually built one, didn't they? Uh, called Terror. That you could actually stop in. Yeah, has that, been, got, has that been complete yet? I know that was the plan. I think it. I think COVID put an end to uh, it. Of I course. think they, they were just about to start, and unfortunately, yeah, the the, the COVID came along, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. That's so, it. I, that, so I went to their Kickstarter Indiegogo website to see what was going on, right. and uh, they are they are planning to restart once they can. Right. Uh, but I mean, it looks amazing. I'm, I was so close to paying for an Indiegogo stay in the uh, in Terra. How much? How much was it? it? Wasn't that much? It was something like I don't know, five hundred dollars for a two night stay or okay. something. Okay, doable. You know that it, it's doable, isn't it? I mean, that, yeah, that, save up, save up long enough. That's doable, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> for us Midlanders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So really interesting project, and one of the, one of the other things to to just tie back to where we started the discussion about the impact of, of designers on the sector, is that we've noted here that um, it, it has a couple of windows, uh, much like the ISS. Hmm. And uh, and the story that came to mind when thinking about that was was the history of the arguments about whether or not it's necessary to have windows. Incredible. <laughs> I, th- I, I think the history there is related to Skylab. And hmm. uh, after after the imp- input of, of Raymond Lowe, the, um, uh, the industrial designer, brought in to try and improve Skylab, who I believe was constantly sort of up against discussions about with the engineering department, the technical challenges versus the, the qualitative value. One of the arguments they had around Skylab was whether or not it should have a window. Uh, yeah. And of course, it's an extra technical challenge to put a window into, into Skylab. And there was resistance from the engineer. Raymond Lowe won out and they agreed to put the window in. And, and I've seen it suggested, uh, I think quite rightly, it's the history and value of that and the recognition of the value on the mental health of the astronauts and the communication about how you demonstrate the experience that possibly became the reason that the ISS had a cupola in it and became such a critical part of sort of science communication. Well, I mean, when you see a photograph in the ISS of an astronaut, they're in that cupola looking down on Earth, aren't mm. they? Well, the amount of pictures that each of the astronauts takes themselves yeah. of their hometown and, yeah. you know, some of the pictures that Tim Peake took of Britain as he's sort of going over well his his general photography was amazing and they they all seem to be brilliant photographers yeah. and but they they get yeah I mean it would be ludicrous without the without that space it would just be and, and there nearly insane. wasn't there nearly wasn't a window yeah on, there nearly on wasn't Skylab. because the Americans didn't have designers did they as part of their sort of people designing spaceships whereas the Russians did yeah they, yeah they did actually they had they had an architect uh, Kalina yeah. Balashova um, yeah. uh, and I highly recommend that book. Yeah, I mean, her, is, her work is so incredible. The, the work she did on the uh, the Mir station, the, uh, uh, the design for the interior of uh, of those spaces in the Russian program was incredible. It, it thought about orientation. It thought about colour schemes and well-being. It thought about views uh, and the use of the space in a, in a completely different way to the way the engineers would have done on the Apollo mission. And I can't help but wonder how the space race played out in a different way, whether or not our attitudes to um, industrial design, science fiction references, and uh, spaceship design might have played out very differently had the world seen uh, Galina Balashova's interiors, including paintings that she would paint for the cosmonauts mm. to put on the walls that would that would tragically burn up on re-entry, um, of oh. course. Um, <laughs> watercolours that she'd paint herself to put on the walls. Uh, had the had the world seen that front and center, had the Russians won the space race and landed on the moon? I wonder about its impacts on on the history of design. I, I always think to Alien the film when it came out. There's many aspects to Alien the film when it came out that was just mind blowingly good. But one of them was the fact that it was the first time we were so used to Star Trek and all those kind of things having pristine white interiors. Even 2001 is guilty yeah, of it. Yeah. Whereas 
<laughs> whereas um, Alien, it was a ship, a working environment that looked like a factory, yeah. looked like a you know, yeah. look, look, looked like a place of work, yeah. of hard work. You know, not not <laughs> not someone in a in an office in their thinking area with a bowl of cornflakes. Part, part, part was, of yeah. part of the military industrial complex, as opposed yeah. to just corporate America. Yeah, I guess society at the time shapes what things look like. You can tell a Russian rocket; it just looks Russian. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's just odd, isn't it? That that design somehow makes itself manifest in in things that seem to be just practical on the on the surface. But yeah, uh, I, which 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 is the interesting thing, isn't it? About about these habitats, and I have to say, I do think Marsha looks great as a as a as a habitat it does it does and and and, and really communicates the, the the value of thinking carefully about every every single aspect of that uh, design beyond just the engineering the interiors are stunning hmm. it looks like an environment that, uh, that 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 you would happily dwell in my, my inner reservation about all that body of work that I, I think i shared on the discord at the time with the rest of this podcast uh which sort of leads into a, what we might talk about in the mars society competition his minor reservation with that work is that it it, it continues to uh, focus on this uh, sort of a remake of the single dwelling. Mm. It's almost a version of the suburban family home dotted across the landscape. And whilst I can infuse about the quality of the the space themselves and the material science and the rigor that goes into them, to see them standing alone in that extreme environment with 300 yards of no atmosphere between you and your neighbor is actually slightly terrifying at the same time oh god yeah i mean it's yeah. it's 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 very similar it, when i see things like that it reminds me of frontier america the, yeah. the, the sort of thing you see clint eastwood living in a farming in a little house with his ill wife yeah. in some yeah. bleak spaghetti western somewhere absolutely so so, it, so that yeah. sort of the, the the individualism that rests within mm. that single dwelling be it for two people or a, you know a family of four, it still remains quite bleak to me in many respects. Yeah. So that was my inner reservation about that whole body of work. Really, is there were beautiful individual dwellings that really pushed on this paradigm, uh, but uh, but I think there's still sort of a missing quality there that recognises that there needs to recognise the need for community and connection uh, in such an extreme environment. So well, let's let, let's go on to the Mars Society. So uh, <laughs> you sent me an, an an email in the Discord saying. Matt, do you fancy having a go at the uh, Mars Society, uh, yeah. <laughs> Mars Society um, <laughs> hand in? And of course, me being me said, oh, yes, I love that idea. Of course, not having anywhere near enough time to be able to. <laughs> well, e- equally to <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to To do this. And, um, but, you, but you gave it a go. You gave it a go and you, you started building your, your submission. So that, tell us a little bit about your sub- submission and, and where you started and, and how you sure. sort of went about it. So um, it, it became a bit of a lockdown project in some respects. Mm-hmm. Kept me amused in uh, uh, lockdown evenings, al- along with the, um, the only the lockdown projects uh, going at the time was the, um, the homemade telescope with the Raspberry Pi and the metal ductwork. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was quite good fun. Um, uh, the PyCon, if anybody wants to Google for that, that's 3D printed parts to make your own telescope with a Raspberry Pi. Um, so as a lockdown project, I um, uh, developed a, a concept and an initial idea for it, um, but quickly became clear that it's such an expansive uh, competition requirement that it requires a, a substantial team to really do it justice, to engage with all the different topics. And that's what some of the winning entries demonstrated is teamwork. Um so, so the, the competition this year um, was for the design of a Mars city-state of a million people. So it was nothing if not ambitious. And uh, so the description on the, on the website, the brief, was a city-state of a million people that should be self-supporting to the maximum extent possible, relying on a minimum mass of imports from Earth. It is not necessary that the city-state be built in all one lake location. It can be done that way, or one or more central cities can be set up, supported by outlying bases. And then there were various points that you get for different uh, aspects of the competition, technical design, economic, social, cultural, political, and aesthetic. Um, and it had a lot of entries. Um, the final count, uh, looking on the website, was that they, they received a total of 175 applications from over a dozen countries. And uh, the final five chosen presented their proposals at the Mars Society Conference last year in October. Um, with the first place going to a, a multinational team called Nexus Aurora, 
uh, we've had a really, really interesting submission that we can we can talk about. So, so I, I I developed a concept for this and got as far as just sort of scratching the surface with it, but really tried to um, uh, engage with that question of how you might use terrestrial urban design history to think about this 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 competition and town planning and city planning on a uh, on another planet. And my primary interests were around the question of um, ideas about the commons as a shared civic space and its relationship potentially to, um, to, to a breathable atmosphere and how you avoid that sort of classic uh, dystopian sci-fi scenario of somebody having control of the air, which has been you know, visited many times through sci-fi in, in, the, in the past. Um, so, so my project was called um, the, the Space That Launched a Thousand Ships, or Isotropic Planning for Resilience and Equality, a Distributed Network of Martian Archipelagos, or <laughs> How to Make Civic Space in a World that Has No Breathable Commons. So I uh, tried to wring as much as I could out of that title. Uh, that 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 I, I really like that last one, How to Make Civic Space in a World that Has No Breathable Commons, yeah. because... Is this something that people think about a lot in in on Mars, or, or do you think you've really hit upon something? Because that 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 does seem to be an extraordinary point. Well, I mean, I'm not alone in, in, in thinking about obviously shared communal space uh, as mm. part of a future in a, a, a habitat, but I think questions around the politics of ownership and control of that of that space are critical and relate intimately to our understanding of a city. So my interest in, in, in the idea of a city and how we experience it on, on Earth is that a city is made of those civic public spaces. The buildings that, uh, that, that, that are designed and built in a city, those buildings shape public space. Mm. And it's our ability to, to use that civic public space uh, to, uh, to have freedom of movement, to, um, to enjoy anonymity amongst so many people, which is a critical sort of... Uh, uh, mental protection in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment of many, many strangers, your ability mm. to, to move around civic public space with freely and with anonymity is key. And my thinking around this was also influenced at the time around lockdown because I was uh, 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 listening to the audio book of the fantastic work of uh, Rebecca Solnit, a book called Wanderlust. You've ever heard of that? It's a, it's a study of walking, the history of walking. No way. Uh, it's a fantastic book that I can recommend to everybody. And the audio book is particularly good, actually. So going on long lockdown walks, listening to a book about walking, uh, Solnit explores the importance, the sort of uh, emancipatory importance of, of walking uh, and uh, f- uh, the freedom that it affords to not be reliant on, uh, on other people's modes of transport or boundaries or territory. So these are all qualities that I think are key to making a city, and that's what influenced the... Uh, the proposal really so so the the idea was that um you would uh, construct small groups of settlements and uh, the mechanics of it i was looking at at the time was around ideas that you might uh, issue sort of a, a, a fleet at a time of three different communities um to travel to mars and uh, and, and set up a, a habitat and that those communities might have slightly different agendas it might be one commercial one, one state one, or somewhere in between, some sort of NGO. And they would set up a settlement uh, adjacent to each other, but then have an agreement fundamentally to turn the space between those settlements into this shared common space. And then you would repeat that at a wider scale across, across the city. So thinking about the negative space between the settlements was my idea of what represents the heart of the city. And what I was doing there as well uh, was exploring past examples of urban design proposals, and particularly the the, the really interesting work of an architect uh, called Eric uh, Gloden, um, uh, who uh, around uh, well, early 20th century um, had uh, some urban design theories around the idea of a non-hierarchical city, where you would uh, you wouldn't have a centre as such you would have a uh, distribution of sort of nodes across the landscape of all equal um, importance. So there was no um, centre that could become the centre of power, I guess, Mm. and the economic um, activity would be wide and varied because there was no centre as well. 
So that was part of the, the influence there. Uh, and the backstory I discovered through that research was very interesting. Tragically, Gloden uh, his, and his family were, were, were executed by the Nazis in, in 1944 uh, for, for um, harbouring uh, wanted people from the Gestapo. Um, so to discover that at the time as well, and to think about uh, uh, the comparable histories of the likes of von Braun through that period uh, was was quite yeah. interesting too. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, certainly if you lived in that part of Europe, in the, your your fate was yeah. completely unknown, wasn't it? Absolutely, really? That's yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, horrendous. So, so that was part of the history. And then another aspect to it was um, the, uh, the the a, a classic piece of work by uh, by an Italian uh, uh, that formed the, the Nolly Plan. Have you ever heard of the Nolly Plan before? Uh, no, I'm not. No. So uh, the, the not uh, Gian Battista Nolly. I'll, I'll let you do the accents. Gian Battista Nolly. That's it. Nailed it. I think. I think that's the one. Nailed it. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, so the the Nolly Plan or the Nolly Map, uh, an often cited sort of critical device for understanding cities, and it's it's a map of Rome in which he was drawing the layout of Rome, its buildings and its public spaces, and it's a, it's what's got a figure ground plan. And the figure, of course, is the buildings and the, the ground, the open space between them. But the, the key difference that, that, that Nolly enacted with his plan is that he didn't just draw the spaces between the buildings. He also drew all the spaces within buildings, such as courtyards or churches, that were open public space you could go into. So what he was drawing was open, free space that the city consisted of. That history, that idea that the Nolly plan could influence the way you think about negative and positive space, vacuum versus building space was a, a key part of that. Uh, to, to return to, to Fred Sharman's influence, that was a, that was a key part of sort of the, uh, the, the opening idea for, uh, for, for that section. That, that One of the quotes from Fred's Space Settlement book is, um, perhaps one could imagine that space is hard in another sense of the word, a kind of solid poche, an inversion of figure and ground in which humans carve out a cosy hollow softness within that hard space. The idea being that rather than taking the atmosphere around us for granted, in an interplanetary sense, where there is hardly any atmosphere, you have to carve an existence out, your, out for yourself in that space and make a civic, breathable commons. It always feels like that anyway, in terms of, like, if you think about the story, well, in my mind it is, I mean, I, I might be completely wrong, but in my mind, when you think about the way that Europeans went to a, the Americas, and like when you look at the story of Oklahoma or something like that, and just how yeah. crazy that of like, like a big land grab one morning and and carving out your space and saying this bit's mine. Yeah. It feels it feels similar, but it feels like back when humans were making cities in the olden days, it was all haphazard. Like take London, it's just it's just a hat. There was no plan. It's just I'm going to try and build it here. I'm going to squeeze this tiny building in between these two massive buildings. And that that that's also been you know a key part of the history of urban design discussion over the last few decades as well. How uh, how much you plan and organise a space uh, versus how much you leave for um, uh, chance and opportunity and ambiguity, which again is something we touched on in the interview. We're going to uh, uh, share share later. There's bits of the interview I really love because it, it's the first time for me that I'm thinking about these things, yeah. and I'm sure you thought about them a lot. And uh, absolutely, and, and, it, and it raises questions of of whether or not there is there is scope for accepting any sort of ambiguity in future plans when settling on a on, on a on a, a, another planet. Because of course, normally the expectation is that all these things have to be absolutely nailed down to the nth degree, mm. that everything has to be fully understood. But that, that isn't historically how the most successful, vibrant cities. Have, have, have developed and grown up of course yeah well, it's, it's funny because it's like with events uh, uh, when i'm teaching event management I'm, I'm always talking about the importance of like planning everything and advancing everything right. but when i do it myself i'm all i i always leave quite a lot of room for improvisation because yeah. i know that the plan isn't going yeah. to it's that it's that art of war, isn't it? It's it's the the plan isn't going to survive the first <laughs> contact with the enemy. So I, I I'm better prepared being able to think on my feet. Yeah, and that, and and Absolutely. actually that you'll come up with a better plan, and everything will almost certainly work out for the best. The only time I've not seen that happen is the fire festival, which is an excellent documentary. I've not seen that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I heard about really that. Good. I, I, you weren't involved with that, were you? 
No, no. Oh, I God, thought you were no, going to tell God, me that no. you planned that no, to the nth degree. No, <laughs> to, to, to be honest, it, it, it rang so true, the whole of that document. I had people literally phoning me up going, oh, my God, did that remind you of anything? Really? Like that? And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a classic documentary right. about not planning enough. But you, you, they almost pull it off where, where there really isn't, where they had no right to. Right. But I, I always think that that's the same with, with things like this, is that there has to be. A level of improvisation with something like Mars because there's 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 billions of unknowns. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or, and worse, unknown unknowns. Unknown unknowns. Yeah, those tricky buggers. Um, so, <laughs> so, so that's a, that's a key question for me. Is how, how do you how do you foster a, a system which which allows for that ambiguity? Because that's what every city thrives on. Uh, you know, a civic public space um, can have a, a, a different role or purpose every few minutes that seems very challenging where every uh, every bolt and every airlock and every corridor has to be tightly controlled a space is almost certainly going to become something that you never envisaged it becoming like speaker's corner or yeah. you know those kind of things isn't it and and they're the exciting spaces they're the, they're the spaces that people talk about that's a great reference actually how would you how would you engender speaker's corner on on a future Martian city, in a future Martian city, in a way that that, that ensured that somebody couldn't neutralise it by switching off the air. Yeah, I mean, granted, there are days when Speaker's Corner perhaps could do with the air being switched off, but <laughs> but but it's critical, isn't it? That's 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 an absolutely perfect example. Where's the Martian Speaker's Corner? How far did you get? How did you, far did you get with your plans? And do you plan on building it up? And yeah, uh, like, maybe I, maybe we can have it as the after seeing the Discord for the next Nexus Aurora that we're going to talk about. Yeah. That that is something else, isn't it? That just for the Discord alone, Absolutely, Nexus yeah. Aurora yeah. Discord, it, it, it's like it is. it is. It's monumental. Yeah. It's actually genius. Uh, it, it's it, it's a it's an amazing feat of collaboration. So my own project, I got as far as uh, a series of diagrams and, uh, and and key descriptions that set the tone for the piece, and then a few notes to share. Uh, so happy to put the link to the Google Doc in, in the notes for the show afterwards, and people can. Uh, can have at it, and I'd like to push it further. I'd like to explore it uh, in in more detail and see where it's uh, where it can take us. But yes, the winning entry for the Mars Society Comp, the Nexus Aurora one, was a was a huge collaboration. Um, yeah, so let, let, let yeah let's talk about it. So, I mean, it's it really is extraordinary, isn't it? You watch the video of their interview with the Mars Society, with their grilling from Zubrin and people like that. <laughs> it's like. They they really do come across as a bunch of people that have sort of surprised themselves almost. Absolutely, and uh, I think uh, when we were talking about it earlier, I think one of the observations for me was that I think the Mars Society is to be commended for recognising what's been achieved with this submission and rightly awarding it first place. Because my gut reaction when I saw it, it was that some of the the position they take over some topics questions those very things that previous Mars Society submissions have really focused on. So in the opening gambit for their for their for their presentation, they they acknowledge that they're not going to talk about technical details. They're going to talk about decision making and how they got to the final conclusion. And that you know that had me captured from from the opening line. But yeah, so a, a, a multinational team, fifty plus members, hundred pages of technical reports, five gigabytes of renders and models, and sixty thousand group messages to compile this thing. That's the summary in the end of their report. I mean, that alone is a feat of collaboration, like it, nothing it's, else. It's unbelievable. But but they were even quizzed by the by the quiz masters, like who's the person leading all yeah. this? And there was no answer, was no, there? No, the, yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, how, yeah. how have they done yeah. this? I don't get it. Yeah, I think there was one yeah, person yeah. responsible for sort of some of the questions and putting the report together finally, but but ultimately there was no single leader, and, and that alone was was really, really impressive. It's very, very um, interesting. Yeah. It's, it's super interesting yeah. how – it's really interesting that just the way that they've used Discord as this amazing – management system yeah I've, I've never seen anything I've, like it i'm gonna i'm gonna have to steal that for I, well that's that's <laughs> the first thing i thought for the for, for, for the spot cats we there's some really interesting sort of techniques there <laughs> um but yeah i've dabbled i'm I, I, I've, I've signed up for the discord and uh when i've lurked long enough i, I shall put my head above the parapet and talk about some ideas and see if there's any any interest so I like yeah so what what was your favorite bit of their their winning entry what 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 sort of really grabbed you on it? Um, well, I suppose, uh, I mean, there were overlaps with my own ideas around urban planning uh, and the things I was just talking about, about city design. And so if, if we start with that, then uh, they, uh, they, they reference the history of architecture and urban design. So straight away, I'm like, yeah, okay, somebody's 
paying attention here, um, <clears throat> which I really enjoyed. In their example, uh, they they turned to um, a, a, a British urban design uh, concept called the Garden City that was developed by mm. Ebenezer Howard. And that's a phrase you might have heard before. Yeah, yeah. No, I was really fascinated by that because I've, I've actually looked up Garden City before because yeah. I, I kept I kept thinking to myself, why why is it called Welland Garden City? And it's like, oh, I get it yeah. now. So, yeah. so Welland Garden City was was one of the first uh, attempts at, at the Ebenezer Howard concept of the Garden City, which sought to um, to combine the best things of both the rural and urban existence. And some of uh, Ebenezer Howard's early work uh, diagrams showing this sort of uh, what this the, the pull from these two uh, places. That in the urban environment, uh, uh, much more labour can be achieved and things can get done, but it's an unpleasant environment to be in. Uh, in the rural environment, it's a pleasant environment, but it's but it can be static and slow and not a great deal gets achieved. So we sought to combine these these two these two forces. Where I diverge from the Nexusaurus submission is that m- my argument would be that the Garden City proposal still had that centre. So in its, mm. in, if you look in the diagrams of the Garden City proposals, it was it's a radial diagram. Uh, around a center in zones um, and there are different attitudes to to the idea of naming and zoning a city because whilst it can foster some uh, something and, and and direct ideas and development it can also hinder mm. so i so i that was sort of the divergence for me between my own thoughts around the idea of the the, the non-hierarchical city as a as a utopian idea versus the the ebenezer Howard one um but other aspects of it that were really interesting um, around the habitats themselves. So the habitats were very bold, ambitious, um, large structures that were a combination of the regolith mounding idea for radiation protection with the big five metre thick walls around the outside edges and then a three metre thick uh, a swimming pool over the over the structure. So there was... <laughs> well, the, the very first thing I said to George as we were watching it was, well, you know... <laughs> Three tons of water as a roof. What what could possibly oh, go quite. wrong? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's slightly nerve wracking. I must admit, um, yeah. uh, but that they make a compelling argument for um, for that. And and again, where where I was uh, interested in their tone is that from the get go, they talk about wanting to dismiss uh, and reject ideas around uh, uh, buried below ground habitats and to to mm. hold on to. The meagre sunlight that is there uh, as a as a resource for well being as well. So I think that, that that was something that really really interested me too. So the sunlight yeah, filtered through that, that that water top. Yeah, well, it's definitely a massive plus. And that, the the bit that interested me was that there was living spaces that clearly weren't that protected as well. These kind of public spaces that you would, I guess, as a citizen, know you shouldn't spend too long in there, but you'd enjoy them while you're there. Yeah, I think they sort of take a really balanced attitude with some of these things, and yeah. I think that's probably the outcome of having 50-plus commenters on it. Um, it plays out in things like the the section they have on uh, on EVA suits, I thought was very interesting, is that the goal with the, the EVA suits is to make them dead easy to manufacture and repair, so they're not uh, high-precision bits of technology. Um, they, they describe them as a partial pressure suit for uh, for minimum eight hours use or maximum rather uh, of the type worn by fighter pilots um, rather than a really extensive suit. And then they combine that, I think, with a um, uh, an emergency setup like a hood that would uh, just give you some breathable oxygen in an environment where if there was a sudden emergency, you could get from one space of the city to another. So that's very interesting. They had a really interesting position on um, a modular robot robotic platform. So to come back mm. to the automation thing again, they're committed to heavy automation throughout all their industry. But they, well, they, what they call what do they call it? The techno sphere. Yes, yeah, I think that was the phrase. But just the, the a modular robotic system, where each uh, unit can have parts interchanged and easy to repair and fix with an open source design, I thought was very interesting. Uh, again, the politics of ownership and control, much like the civic space discussion. Uh, you know, you know the Boston Dynamics robots. You've yeah. seen those with the, you know, the really incredibly yeah. Yeah, advanced yeah. Uh, robots. Now, do you, do you do you know how to turn one of those off? Because I don't. <laughs> no. If one of those things came at me, I couldn't power it down. Yeah, you'd have to. Everyone would have to be equipped with a electromagnetic. Uh, yes, pulse probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so, so the idea of a robotic platform that was an open source modular setup. At least we might all know where the off switch is. So that, that could be good. Mm. Um, so uh, that was a, a few of the key elements to it uh, in there. And then the final part of it, 
that really probably just um, exposes my own politics, is they really engage with the combination of the need for a welfare state in collaboration with independent um, uh, corporation and, uh, and business as well. Now, did I hear UBI mentioned? You did. You did. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so my my left of centre politics alarm went went off, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, we'll have, we'll have some of that. So, yeah, what they call a pseudo UBI, which is there yeah. to provide fundamental life support and basic food. So I suppose their leverage for access to confidence in an oxygen supply is through their economic policy, the, the UBI, as an idea that you, that you would uh, be allowed that as a fundamental right. I guess slightly sullied for me in part of the report later on where they then talk about the need for um, for NFC chips to control access to different parts of the structure. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, well, the, the, the whole technosphere was was the humans were part of it, weren't yeah. they? As in everything was part of the technosphere. So the, the, the robots running on AI, like a big Amazon warehouse, yeah. and the humans were part of that, and and the AIs would make sure that if there's a bunch of people in one area that they would get more oxygen pumped down yeah. there. And yeah. the whole thing was very and, – and they they showed this kind of circular system and how it all worked, which I thought was really interesting. But, yeah, there was a little bit of an alarm bell on my well, – <laughs> I, I suppose fundamentally this – you know, this this is an accelerationist position, yeah, mm. about a commitment and an acceptance to the value of of technology and and, and its ability to, to to save the human race. Now, what I love about that uh, about that discussion is that there's a left wing accelerationist view and there's a right wing version of that, mm. and uh, that that phrase can be used in many different ways. So I think they smartly sort of played on elements of uh, science and technology enthusiasm and passion. That the Mars Society is uh, historically, uh, you know, very famous for, uh, but then gave it a slight twist with discussions around UBI and rights as well. And it, to be fair, it was a, it was a common discussion, I think, in some of the other the shortlisted entries too, to really engage with that question of liberty versus community. Yeah, that their whole economic structure, if I got this right, was to was to be such a big city and an industrious city that they would be selling to countries that wanted to uh have settlements yeah. on mars yeah that was their central economic position that they i think they started by saying that um uh that uh relying on tourism was unrealistic um mm. that you know only a handful of people will ever bother or be able to afford to just pay to go to mars so it had to have a serious industry and they saw themselves i think what they call themselves a, a foundry for materials mm. for, for for other interplanetary settlements which economically sounded like a very smart move, uh, a bold move in the sense of the discussions that usually go on at the moment around planetary protection issues. So here we are making our first Mars settlement and we're strip mining the place. Uh, but not only that, why do you need the humans? You know, yeah. you, they've already started to prove that you can automate everything. Then it says, well, so, what, so why all the humans then? Why, why does there need to be these tens of thousands, millions of people living there? For the, for the poetry. Yeah, <laughs> so that, that's what we're there for that, that, to give uh, yeah, to give I meaning mean, to the entire endeavor. Yeah, but it does. Yeah, but that for me that that's what was missing then in that case was was the meaning. I think I think when I was sitting there thinking, I, I wasn't sat. I thought that Robert because it was Robert Zubrin that asked that question. Yeah, and I thought that at least he could that there would be a follow up question to it but presumably they were running out of time they, they were running out, they had a, what was disappointing about that presentation if i'm critical of the system is that they had a very short time for questions it seems on the presentation yeah and, yeah and if you watch the uh, if you watch this the, the runner up the, the australian team who came second place very closely uh the final question they don't actually even have time to answer it properly because they've got a sharp mm. clock on it which is a shame that there wasn't more debate and argument going on there but on that question of sort of meaning and poetry what i also quite liked about the submission is there's a there's an area where they 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 propose landmarks uh, and the role of landmarks as a, as a, as a social sort of uh, uh, focal point. So they've got an idea for the, a monument for fallen wanderers as a piece of architecture. Uh, landmarks around technology for large infrared telescopes. But they have a thing uh, called the Tree of Life, where they propose to plant a giant redwood tree on day one and then protect it and encapsulate it in a, in a structure that becomes a huge landmark as well. So, so there, wow. there, there was there was poetry and humanity in that submission. Yeah, yeah. I, I I love things like that. But uh, imagine how if you only had one giant redwood tree that meant so much, yeah. it'd be a little bit stressful, wouldn't it? It would. Much? When you when you've run out of uh, fuel, 
<laughs> and somebody thinks, you know what? Well, we could burn the oh, tree. We could, we could burn the tree. Let's just go for it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just, you know, yeah, it's it's just sod's law, isn't it? That it will get a disease and and die, you know, and 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 it and it holds so much meaning. Yeah. It's a bit like the the ravens at, at the, the Tower of London. London. Yeah, it's like absolutely. it's like yeah. no, it's it's like why have you done that? Because now when they do fly off, <laughs> everyone's going to fall into despair. Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah, well, well, moving on from this, we we had a really in, really interesting interview earlier on in the week with an artist and an architect a collaborative team a collaborative team but i mean really it's a it's an art project called the mars house which is going to be built in bristol just down the road from well it's kind of equidistant from us too isn't yeah, we'll it to, it's, it's the halfway we'll have point. to meet up for a future episode yeah be perfect. <laughs> we definitely have to meet up for that episode and um they're building this mars house and well you're you're here it's a really interesting uh way round about thinking about this particular issue should we play it? Let's do it. Let's do it. A cute The Interplanetary Podcast is alive! First of all, welcome to the podcast, Owen and Nikki. I'll let you um, go first, Nikki. Yeah, so uh, my name's Nikki Kent. I'm an artist and I work with my friend Ella Good. And we have created a project called Building a Martian House. Um, the project is to do just that. It is a massive co-design project where we're going to be building a Martian house in the middle of Bristol um, and it's already been designed with a, through a process with the public and um, we're going to be building in spring summer 2022. Uh, when it's in Bristol it's not just a finished example it's still an invitation for people to come along and to help us build across the six months that it'll be on the harbour side in the centre of Bristol. So how did you get to this, this project idea then, Nikki? You mentioned in your video the, uh, uh, the experience you had at the Utah Analogue Research Centre. Is, how, how were you introduced to this field? Well, so me and Ella, I guess we just uh, spent, spend a lot of time looking on the internet at different things like this, like these, um, these missions that are happening here on Earth and scientists uh, practicing to go to Mars. Um, and we just, uh, well, we saw lots of examples of this over many years. Like we used to talk about Mars 500 years ago. Um, and then we really got interested in the, in the Mars One project where they asked lots of people um, to apply to be the first humans on Mars. Um, and then we also saw the Mars Desert Research Station. So it, it, over quite a long period of time, a few years, we were, we were kind of looking out of our own interest and talking about it when we would go on long car journeys together. And because we're artists, we're used to kind of, if we find something interesting, we think about how can we make something to do with it. I guess it's quite simple. We saw lots of people were building houses around the world um, for practicing life on uh, on Mars, and we thought, let's have a go at making our own. Really, it's like you see one thing and you think, let's do our own. And then as soon as we started to do that, we realized we actually didn't really know anything about Mars and uh, we're not scientists. And we tried to draw a design and it's just a circle with a plant in the middle and a solar panel on it. And I've still got it now, but um, yeah, we had no idea. So we thought, okay, we're going to have to do a lot of research. Um, and also we realized it actually wouldn't be possible for for the two of us to make something that, that was good in any way. And that's when we decided to start inviting people to help us. And that's what the project has actually become. Is that where Owen steps in then? I think Ella and Nikki had been um, talking or looking at Mars for sort of 10 years before a long time before we got involved. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, we, it'd been quite a few years and then within this idea of just like telling loads of people about the project, um, we told the architecture centre here in Bristol about it. 
and went for a chat with them. And then when we were talking to them, uh, they were like, have you heard of Hugh Broughton Architects? Because they would be perfect to help with this because they designed the British Antarctic Research Station and all of the similarities between that um, with that living in isolation um, and yeah, and extreme weather conditions and the similarities in Mars and Earth in the Antarctic. So the, the, the technical challenges for, for extreme environments are obviously a key part of this and, and fascinating for me as an architect to consider. But I, but I must admit that the, the fact that this is the seed of this idea began with, with artists, I thought was particularly interesting. And you do yourself a disservice with that description about just a circle with some plants and a solar panel, because actually, if you go on the NASA server, much of the proposals are a bit like that. Um, so the, 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 the co-working, the co-design element, sorry, the co-design element and the workshops are a particularly interesting part that I thought might surely give this project some uh, 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 richer territory to explore uh, in terms of the uh, social experience and cultural experience and people's needs and desires for the home. So what sort of things have come out of the workshops that, that, you, that you run? Um, so we did, we've done quite a lot of workshops and with lots of different types of people. Some of them have been academics, like actual scientists that have worked on projects that have gone to Mars, some psychologists, and then um, some with the public and those being sometimes school children and uh, sometimes retirees who are interested in lectures, like really varied. Um, and I think uh, we, we've we kind of also, we've not just said um, we're designing a house for Mars, what do you think? We've kind of given people conversation starters we've narrowed down the conversations to get people really started like an example of this is we built a replica of the bedroom on the international space station um, which is really just a cupboard with a sleeping bag in it and a laptop but it was really so that people could walk into a space and see what it felt like and see how small an astronaut's bedroom is now and how minimal it is. And then from there, be able to start questions. Well, if we were redesigning the bedroom, what, what would we take with us to another planet? What, what do you think um, the primary outcomes were? What were the primary themes coming out of those conversations? Well, we spoke a lot about private space and about... Um, some of that is cultural, like we we're in Bristol, everyone wants their own private space and it, it might not be like that if you did this in another place in the world. Um, and also about the ideas about being able to customise the space and being able to choose it, not wanting it to be too, um, mostly we see space design as being very slick um, and not very homely, but, but people might not actually want to live in that long term. Um, and then people being very interested in colour and touch and things like that and thinking about what what they might miss from Earth in that that kind of sense of things. When you were doing um, workshops with, with various, all these different groups, is there a recurring theme that starts to starts to develop and one that you spot that you were surprised about? Toilets. Everyone, everyone wants to talk about toilets in space. It always, always comes up. What's it going to be like? How do you do it? Even how you have a shower. You know, some of the really normal um, things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis are the things that people want to know if they will be different. You know, how how will things change for me in my daily life when I'm in space? So I'd say those themes always always come up again. And then we had. Uh, kind of similar things that people want to take with them. Um, pets often came up um, and laptops. Kids wanted to take like a computer with them or something to play with. Um, they were kind of reoccurring, but it's the ones that, you know, are completely left field, I think, are the ones that have stuck with us. Like, why would you take anything from Earth? You're on Mars. You know, I wouldn't take anything. You're there on Mars. Don't take anything with you. It was kind of something that we talk about quite often, I think. Yeah, there was this, um, I always refer to this one woman, 
on this day of the workshop, everyone was talking about like, oh, let's make it all green and blue like earth and let's, you know, have the smell of grass in the air, like freshly cut grass and things like that, like very earthly things. And then this woman came in and she was like, no, why would you do that? That is terrible for your mental health. You're going to Mars and you need to celebrate where you are and enjoy it. And she kind of gave this example of how her husband had been a coach driver for holidaymakers, um, like pensioners coming going from England to Europe. And he would um, drive people to Europe. And then when they got there, they complained about that the, you know, the food wasn't like the food from home or the hotel wasn't like a British hotel. And really all those people, they on the on these trips just wanted to look at Europe through the window and not be part of it and she kind of was like currently our designs from Mars were just not really experiencing or yeah. thinking about being on Mars so that, that's really interesting because I think one I was curious about whether or not the workshops had explored that question of what sort of support items mental psychological support items people might want to take with them uh, in that in that process uh, around that question of well-being in an extreme environment so um, um, I don't know whether that's anything that um, Owen your work before in terms of extreme environments and the time at Hugh Broughton ever came up that question of how the internal environment um, needs to reflect either home or homely comforts uh, versus just the raw machine qualities required to survive in that space. I think one thing that's important to note about this project is from an architectural team, we've sort of designed the shell and core of the building. We're designing, you know, the services and the layout. But when it actually gets on site, there's six months of continued workshops with the public. So we deliver the house and there's six months to decide what should be in it to make it a home and what's important. From uh, sort of Antarctica, there's definitely some um, well-being sort of lessons learned. Big one, probably the hydroponic living room. So in Antarctica, the hydroponic you know, growing systems are often places that the residents like to congregate around. So in the American bases, you, you can actually book the hydroponic room to have your meetings. Um, so that was something that we were kind of keen to integrate and then also in Antarctica, you're often there's issues of sensory deprivation. Um, so we've often uh, in Halley Six, um, Hugh Broughton Architects specified Lebanese cedar because it's the only veneer that gives off a scent. So it's quite subtle things like that that we thought you know the hydroponics in our Martian house are there for you know production of some fresh uh, fresh food and fresh vegetables but are also there to be tended by the residents because it sort of might be slightly homely, but also gives those sort of sensory, de those sensory deprivation, alleviating sort of characteristics. So is it, is it being used as an opportunity to test some of these material choices and details in a fairly technical way, or is it more a, you know, a mock-up or a visual representation of the spaces and, and, and types of experience you might have? Well, uh, we're working on that at the moment. We're going through the technical design and uh, we want this house to be as realistic as possible. So when it's finished, um, maybe ask that ask us that question again and we'll let you know how we've got on with, uh, you know, building it as realistically as we would on Mars. There's definitely sort of uh, some of the servicing and waste treatment um, sort of technologies we're looking to integrate, uh, but there's lots of things at play in terms of, you know, time, budget, et cetera. So sure. you know, yeah. let's see in, in uh, what was it now? It's eight months time when it opens. Um, we'll have a conversation about how realistic uh, the, uh, the detailing, et cetera, is. I like guess, any, so, any yeah, that's what one thing me and Ella have always said is we want to make it as real as possible. See what's really achievable by people who have a, you know, fraction of the budget of NASA what can we build that's actually real? Um, sometimes I think, is that a totally ridiculous thing to say? And then, and then sometimes I think, oh, maybe it will, you know, have um, some water recycling system in it and real plants and be powered by solar panels and 
you know, push the bits that we can as far as we can, because I think that is exciting for a public to see it being actually real. Yeah. So will anybody be living in it overnight for any period of time or is it just for visitors? Um, well, OK, we, it would be nice for someone to stay in it. And we, me and Ella have spoken about that a lot. And I don't, we've, we kind of are like, maybe someone could stay in there for a weekend or as a, and maybe make something from that inspired by it. Uh, maybe an artist could stay in it. Uh, but it's mostly the purpose will be building it and then showing yeah. it to a lot of people. I'm sure Matt will be keen to stop over I, if there's opportunity. I, I, I was going to say, I was just about to say, it sounds like the perfect opportunity for a weekend for an interplanetary podcaster to pretend he's on Mars for a bit. Ah, oh, great. And, uh, <laughs> so if you need a guinea pig, I'm, I'm, I'm totally up for it. Yeah, great ocean show. Some isn't? of those things came out of the, the workshop that um, sort of inspired the layout. So, you know, dinner parties on Mars are quite important. So the downstairs is a flexible, you know, you can open it out. So actually... You know, there is talk of hosting some Martian dinner parties when it's up in Bristol and, uh, you know, hydroponic views the landscape and Martian sports was something that we had long conversations with. I mean, on the ISS, um, you know, the residents spent hours on running machines trying to stay fit. So how we can sort of integrate low gravity sports was uh, we had some great conversations at uh, the University of West England with the interiors um interior students about what what and they invented a whole series of sports and games that could be played that rather than having to run around on a running machine would be integrated with into the design and uh, that some of the early concept designs because this is a house that we see sitting within a larger base um it's not meant to be you know uh fully self-sufficient though it does have the majority of the life support systems integrated but within the actual wider base we try to integrate exercise into the way you get around rather than having to spend hours locked in a room uh, each time and those are all sort of conversations that have either come out of you know um workshop conversations where people are kind of quite boring on a running machine all the time um or ella and nikki uh having conversations with um, people like Andre Stewart, who is at the Hawaiian Space Exploration Analog, and uh, he was just talking about how difficult it is being surrounded by people at all times, and all he wanted was private space. So, you know, having private bedrooms was kind of super important, but then, you know, we try and make things multifunctional if we can, so that's why it can open up into this sort of living room. room uh, that, yeah. That's a really interesting point about the about it being sort of, its own thing, even though it might be part of a larger complex. It, is that, because I've not really sort of really thought about that before, about, about lots of different individuals bringing their own type of habitat that, that can somehow plug in to a sort of much bigger system. That, that is, is, is that one of the thinking behind the, the, the project, that, that a, a way of sort of maybe becoming more personalised as a space in terms of not just how you sort of do out the interior, but the actual building as well? Because when you, when you go to towns and villages, it's not like all the houses are the same. They're all individual and, and different. Is, is, that, is that embedded in it? To be honest, I'd say no. It's like we have designed this house, but actually it's a lovely idea. What we have uh, created is uh, we think of them as sort of private, semi-private areas and then public space. And the public space is, you know, the largest uh, within the base. Um, so these are sort of little neighbourhoods where you get your the very small private area. Um, but what we have talked about is, uh, you know, we want this to go around the world. And this is kind of a, quite a Western-focused um, design probably of the house definitely uh, all the conversations we've had have been you know mostly in in the UK so if you went and asked um, you know someone in Japan or Singapore you probably get a very different internal solution would it be the external external solution change as well I'm not sure probably in terms of the amount of space and size they need I think the te the, the construction method we're proposing, um, could be adapted to uh, be more 
bespoke for you know a different culture or different type of person's needs. Um, but no, I think it'd be great if there was a whole like little street of different sort of houses that have grown that. And probably that's, I mean, space collaboration seems to be coming back. Um, Russia and China are building a new international space station or proposing, proposing they will. And uh, so maybe on Mars, it won't just be, you know, an American base and an ESA base and a SpaceX base. It will actually be, you know, the town, the Mars town, and it's kind of got modules and stuff um, plugged together, which would be great to see. Well, I mean, I mean, even the space station itself is a bit like that. You know, it's, you know, ESA modules and US modules and Russian modules all. Uh, and they all do have their, you can tell which is which. You can tell that that that, that somehow it's got a European edge to it. Well, <laughs> and the, and the, Italians, yeah, they it's, have, it's weird. Italians, they have the coffee machine. It's got a, <laughs> you know, the espresso maker in space. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, and I'm pretty convinced the Russians have a, a vodka dispenser, but that they're not telling anyone about. <laughs> they're too busy plugging leaks, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> that's what's caused them. That's what's caused them, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that, that question of public versus private space, I, mean, I think is uh, uh, certainly a key interest for me when I look at proposals for interplanetary habitation, because it seems to me that um, we're, of course, in terrestrial um, circumstances used to civic and public and shared space happening between buildings or between habitation in leftover spaces or formally proposed uh, civic spaces. But of course, on uh, on other worlds, that space is a vacuum uh, and still has to be built and managed and created. Um, so I think that seems to be a key part of the discussion about future um, habitations and how we get that balance right between public and private space, certainly. But, when it comes to the construction, then, is there any particular part of um, in situ materials and technical aspects of the project that you're hoping to pursue? We are. I mean, so the the house is split over two levels and essentially anything to do with life support is um, proposed as coming from either Earth or reuse from a rocket. Um, and that's because astronauts don't like playing or fiddling or building their life support systems. So it's proposed that any sort of the, of the, the that sort of technology will come, will come from uh, you know, probably reuse of a rocket and that's buried the lower level. And then the upper level of the house, um, we're proposing a, uh, an inflatable formwork. So it's influenced from sort of, ref- I don't know if you've seen a refugee disaster housing it's quite often impregnated concrete fabrics um, but in this case it is an inflatable that's actually filled with or supposed to be filled with regolith um, providing your radiation shielding and uh, using bacteria to actually solidify or calcify the um, regolith inside so you have your inflatable that seals in the regolith which is um, can be quite poisonous uh, and within that inflatable, you could integrate all your services and, um, you know, insulation, et cetera. And then it's filled, solidifies. There is there is sort of research into the bacteria solidifying regolith. Um, but at the temperatures we're talking about on Mars, there is still a bit of uh, probably some genetic modification or work that needs to be done to actually get the bacteria to do a job uh, not too slowly. And that seems to be the problem. Um, so actually we're reusing the regolith, but not in um, major, major ways related to the house. It's just for the upper level to do the uh, radiation protection. Um, but the sort of wider base, um, because we recognise that there's going to be, for the, the small amount of hydroponics we've proposed, but actually within the house, um, food production is going to have to be scaled up significantly. There'll be uh, areas for vehicles, there will probably be some office and lab space. Um, and depending on uh, how you feel about it, probably some sort of nuclear power. Um, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the... Uh, yeah, this is that. where the... Um, I guess this is where actually it's, it's a quite interesting point about the project, about, okay, so there's this idea of needing to have all the answers. You know, you're designing a house from for Mars, but actually 
maybe we don't need all of the answers by leaving some of them open leaves it that the future is not already decided it's for us to decide and I guess the purpose of the project is to build an optimistic vision of the future um and so we, it's funny because we spoke about this thing about we need two power supplies and uh, one of them would be solar pan- power, but we need a backup. And you would, like, if we speak to the scientists, they say you would have nuclear. But it's not really in keeping with the idea of um, a hopeful future. So I think perhaps... At the moment, it's like it could be that could be open. It could be like not not everything is chosen already. It's we can decide what that other power source is together. Is it people power? Is it is it um, yeah like more um, using little bits of power to make up that additional one rather than having a yeah As, nuclear power. You know, I've, I think this debate is one of the healthiest bits about the project, actually, is that it brings <laughs> these two alternative views to the table. But great. yeah, I mean, one one of the things that I would say about that is is, and this is this is a point that Rob's made to me a few times about how when people start living on Mars and and sort of taking part as, <laughs> particularly if they're not going home, then it's like they will start making their own cultural rules won't they and and so at that at that point you kind of lose control of the situation anyway it'll be that they'll be sitting there going this is the solution we need surely with 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 mars is that something that that, that's come up in terms of of trying to look at what might happen as, as a sort of cultural cultural shift as people start to live like that um, I guess it's very much rooted in earth. Like the conversations are really about what do we want to take with us if we can choose. And I think there's this bigger thing about the future in general and the way we think about it and the way we think of it as being something that is too big for us to have any impact on and um, we're kind of sold messages of uh, apocalyptic futures um, and actually the future's not yet decided and maybe we can spend some time thinking about how do we want the future to be? What future do we actually want to live in? Um, and then for in doing that, seeing that, we'll be able to... Um, make it how we want rather than being like but actually oh we have uh you know the power supply the supplies of power that aren't good for the environment let's just we see we see the we see the project as uh prototype one so this is the prototype of a martian house you know but um we see other ones coming so i think there'll be lessons and you know those kind of cultural things hopefully you can start having those discussions but when the house is up you know with the public in situ and then that might change things going forward if we if we do round two or round three or round four as we go forward as it evolves it's, con- it's a constantly moving changing thing that's kind of uh, impossible to define i guess at the moment so is this is this um uh, prototype being built uh, in bristol um, part of a, a small part of a larger master plan. You've mentioned a few other elements too about shared space and uh, and the bigger base. Uh, have you got designs and drawings uh, uh, underway? So for- the starting point for me as an architect, when we you know gone through a couple of years of um, workshops and so many discussions, we'd done briefing meetings with you know the artists and scientists, and we um, had this kind of vision of what might go into the house. But I had to sort of clear it up in my mind of what it was and where it was sitting and wanted to develop that narrative. Um, so there is some designs and layouts for how this, you know, might work as a wider base that is, is definitely inspired um, by Hugh's work in Antarctica, you know, because we can, we can look at the work that Hugh has done and think about the kind of spaces we might require and the the proportions of spaces. And it, it just helped me 
drawing is is you know it's not a 3d model it's not um drawn in any uh, particular detail but when i was sort of thinking oh so how what is this house actually like and what do you need in it um and it came to actually draw it, it having a wider picture really really helped and i guess some of the big questions if we only had the house for you know two or two people to live in some of the big questions about um mental well-being cannot even be addressed in any way because you definitely can't live just two people so you kind of have to have the further base designed and uh, me and Ella often talk about the central shared space as being a village hall type space a space for people coming together and when we build the house we plan to make an event that is about what happens in this imagined village hall on Mars um, as a way of incorporating a lot of the questions about um, culture and fun and future in, in like something that lots of people can come to. Just, just the introduction of the term village hall for me is interesting because, of course, it's not the sort of vocabulary normally used in discussions about uh, interplanetary habitation. So I think that's, I think that's really healthy. Uh, it's interesting how you talk, Nikki, about uh, about um, impacts on the environment and your reactions to ideas around nuclear power, because of course the environment there is very different to the environment we might be used to choosing to protect or care about here on the Earth. And it's a it's a topic that causes a lot of discussion around ideas about planetary protection and just the very act of going there and having a, an impact on the surface of Mars being an environmental or ecological question mark. So is there particular qualities about the environment or the Martian uh, space that uh, that you would be keen to preserve? And what's your attitude to environment there? That's a really interesting question because mostly we talk about the Martian environment creating a, a kind of, um, you know, the restrictions of it, it being a harsh environment where um, there's limited resources and, you know, a lot of the, uh, it, every, so this idea of everything you you need, you have to take with you. And so then it really makes you discuss what is important. What do you need to take with you? If water is really precious, like you can really see the, the water system in front of you, um, rather than on Earth, it feels, even though it is limited, it feels like, uh, it feels endless. So we more think of it from that direction, the idea of how can it help us, how can the restrictions of Mars help us think about Earth, rather than it being about we're really, um, I guess the project isn't about us pioneering people going to Mars. It's more about how can we use this to think about the future here on Earth? And how is then it relevant to a much wider public? Because these conversations are about all of us, because all of us have a stake in the future on Earth here. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it foregrounds the, the, the relationship with uh, uh, resources and uh, energy systems and uh, life cycle systems. It's, it's very similar to, um, which is, of course, what uh, the, the writer of Dune that was kind of his his starting point was ecological collapse and and uh, and trying to think of what it would be like if you lived in a desert world a bit like mars i suppose where 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 it's a crime to steal someone's water punishable by death <laughs> and things like that so yeah it's 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 really interesting isn't it to kind of think about yeah how how we all might get changed by the different types of environment that we find ourselves in and and that's kind of you as an artist is that is that the sort of major push of the work is to try and make us think more about more about life on earth rather than like you said rather than trying to solve a technical problem of habitation on mars which i'm sure the the architects are trying to do but it, but the purpose of the actual project itself how would yeah, you describe I, it <laughs> yeah it is about what, there is a massive relevance in us using this as a, a scenario to help us think about how we all live and that being really well what what is the job of an artist 
and you know it's to make people think to start conversations and that's what the work is about um and in it being as real as possible it kind of I always think if you you almost it, it, you you help with those conversation starters and people don't need to really think so much just about yeah the issue they they get to it themselves by the provocation mm. if that makes sense is, is <laughs> it, yeah, that, yeah. through your workshop experience do you think then as this this podcast is so much about science communication and Matt does such a fantastic job with that in, in every episode do you think there's a particular experience about the workshops that's uh, giving you a view about how best to do science communication and to engage in these topics with a variety of people? Um, so, yeah, we've been working with scientists and engineers from University of Bristol for a few years and we, you know, we discuss our workshops with them and we we make them together sometimes and they will come along uh, and I'm always amazed how up for listening and um, like these scientists are like that. It's not all about just telling us the answer that I feel like the thing that they find exciting is, is yeah, listening to a public and also kind of um, not being open to being wrong or just listening to our suggestion and being like oh but and then yeah you might think they know a lot more and so they could speak but actually that's the big interest like scientists science maybe isn't just for the scientists it's for all of us to talk about yeah I mean well, <laughs> from my point of view I, I I I think that a good scientist is one that that seeks out the the things that prove them wrong almost that that and and something like mars is great because no one knows no one knows and therefore it's it's just continual discovery and that's what scientists should find and actually it's what artists and scientists and musicians and all those you know anyone who's creative loves that whole idea of of searching into the into you know going into the unknown and and that's yeah, kind of, I... that's what you're doing isn't it really yeah, and I guess that's actually one of the things that really attracted us to building um, building the Martian house because we saw that people were doing this all around the world and there were lots of different versions and something we could do maybe could be as valid as, you know, like what NASA is doing or what um, studies um, the European Space Agency has done before. Um, we saw that there was a space which feels very exciting because when you think about um, research into space, you think of it as something that's cost billions of pounds. It's, it's just for the superhumans and the experts. And then suddenly we were like, no, this is just about living. And nobody knows how a human will react when they get to Mars and we're all experts in living, so yeah. let's invite everyone. It's 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 a novel concept, isn't it? Because I know with with all the other analogs that have been built, that they've built them with a particular question in mind. So they've always had a question that they desperately need to answer at that point. Whereas this one feels more like an open ended question. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. And I guess it is quite different to the analogs because lots of them aren't looking at the technologies of you know it's more about the conditions of that isolation rather than how you recycle things within the house so I guess we're kind of a mix between those two things yeah that's that's yeah that's really interesting so you're actually doing some of the science more than <laughs> than the scientific basis in some way well, different parts of the science. Yeah. I don't know. Do you know these people called the Calgary Space Workers Society? No, not heard of them. Um, so they are an advanced like inventors club in, in Calgary and they are building their own. Um, it was lunar houses, but now it might be Mars as well. Um, and they're kind of 
engineers, retired engineers, and they're building stuff in their back garden that is really high tech. Like it's, yeah, techy and complicated. Like they've done stuff like they've had links with the International Space Station and um, maybe they've made one of their caravans oxygen sealed or something. Like it, it kind of is quite inspiring to see what people are doing in their back gardens as well. Um, and I guess, yeah, so it is like looking, some people are really just looking at the technology in a really detailed way. And some people are looking at the, the isolation and the well-being and conditions like that, even though actually I don't think they really ad necessarily address design and well-being within the design because those isolation studies are normally in shipping containers and um, just big domes and not thinking about other things. Yeah, so it's completely something else. Collaboration, okay. though, sort of that that, that backyard can-do mentality, I think, is is starting to build now through the sort of new space interest that have generated the last few years. Matt and I have been looking this week at um, a, a recent winning submission for the Mars Society competition, Nexus Aurora, and uh, uh, there's some really interesting projects, and Owen, you've been involved, I think, in, in, in some of that. And uh, the, the winning scheme there was a huge open-source project with 50-plus members, uh, wow. as with an international team if you're on their uh, discord it's an amazing place i don't know yeah, i've never seen anything like we, it we've, yeah, we've it's been in this week. so yeah it's, it's it's i think it's really interesting to see these ideas now becoming richer and more diverse through a wider engagement with this um, these concepts beyond just uh jpl nasa and uh, the historical parties to that in terms of the the public and science i mean um, some of the, the members of, or not members, the people who have been, we've been talking to a lot in the team, um, you know, are working directly on missions for Mars at the moment. So, you know, Robert Myhill was working designing the sensors for Mars quakes on the InSight rover. So when we're in a Zoom call or he's, you know, talking to the public or some children at a workshop, you know, actually he knows and you know they it's, it's not often that you can get that exposure you know as, as a normal punter being able to ask someone oh well you know how did you what is that what do you what's your conversation with the rover like today you know and we're in zoom calls and he's like oh yes you know i'll just i'll contact uh, nasa and get that data sent over for the, for the thing so it is you know it, it's really exciting for us as like a to have you know those type of people involved but also i can imagine for the public as well it adds that level of realism that you know we keep telling everyone it's it's a real like a, a real Martian house. We are going to build this as realistically as we possibly can. And when you've got someone there who is, can show you what their rover's up to on Mars, it it uh, you know definitely gets people excited. If if you can describe really what this installation is going to look like and what what people visiting it. Uh, might see and and uh, once it's finished and 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 yeah, what the experience is going to be like. I think Nikki should take this because I can describe it as a you know. But I mean, the drawings are available, and that's what we're, we're intending to deliver uh, in terms of its ex externally and internally. It's as I said, it's a, it's a shell that we expect you know six months of workshops and interaction with the public for Ella and Nikki to change it. Um, beyond recognition but i think that's the that for us as a sort of traditional design team of structural engineers and many engineers and architects you know giving your building over which is definitely unfinished to the public is is really so, yeah so yeah so nikki describe what it would be like for me to walk in on day one and what it might be like for rob to walk in on the final day <laughs> okay so well <laughs> day one there'll be it will be a, a blank canvas an empty shell with a maybe a toilet that's debatable at the moment <laughs> and to see what happens on that um and then across the process there'll be lots of workshops that are really varied and some of them you know will be um things that children can be involved in and other things that will be more for adults with um, and yeah, the scientists and engineers will be joining us for them. 
Um, and then at the end, we hope that we will have filled it and we will have filled it from objects. So for example, if we build a shower, we'll also think about what soap are we going to use on Mars as well? And how do you get those things to Mars? And what will Martian clothes look like? And how will the bedroom be decorated? Um, and we'll work with, maybe we're looking at having two different sleep pods for that. And if we work with two different groups of people, maybe the, the de designs will look really different. So there'll be lots of stuff and ways that people can get involved, like helping us think about it and be practical. And then we're going to be doing tours as well um, so that people can come and just have a look at it. And so the last month should be more focused on the tours to show what we've made along the way. Sounds really interesting. And I think that the idea, the idea that, it, that it isn't just some pristine piece of architecture that Owen hands over on day one and is still the same on the last day, but it's something that is changeable and uh, engage with through events it sounds sounds really I think it, it'll be like the most lived house you've ever seen so it's the house where someone's collected all these objects throughout life but from you know children to you know old people to you know different communities it'd be like hundreds of people from different backgrounds have all lived in the same house so I, I hope it's completely full of different and wonderful objects it's going to be like a hoarder's house <laughs> how how long how long is how long is it up for how long how long is it uh, does it Six run months. for so we should we should be um building in the first three months of of next year um it'll be up six months and then um i mean it's designed to be taken down again uh, and then hopefully we'll go on tour and find a new home somewhere else Will it? Will it? Will it? Will it keep all the things that were already in it, or are you going to start with a blank canvas again? I guess it depends who wants the house. If it, you know, it's totally flexible. If it was a display of what Bristol has made, or if it's a space for for new new ideas, we would be up for both. <laughs> there was talk. One of your questions was about if it was an analog. It would be lovely to go and actually bury the bottom of the house and put it in situ and, you know, go live at it for a long, longer period. Yeah, the living in it would be would be interesting, wouldn't it? I, I just always think with things like that, unless you add the extreme element of danger in, it 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 <laughs> it doesn't quite yeah, it doesn't quite work as an analog. Yeah, we have talked about how how can you make the public or people living there feel like they are they are cut off or um, separated. So there's things we're doing internally to do with um, air, ha air handling. So it is all sealed and you're not naturally ventilating. Um, but also uh, there was discussion about when you arrive to visit it, you're given your spacesuit, you know, and you have to wear your spacesuit as you march through the center of Bristol before you're allowed into the building and you can't take it off until you've gone through the airlock. And there's, you know, that obviously doesn't replicate the the dangers of space, but it can go some way in maybe demonstrating how awkward it might be when you've got sort of six people all wearing helmets trying to get through a door. You know, so it's we, mm. we can try. Yeah, I mean, I always think things like that are really important. Just the how frustrating things can get. Like if I'm doing DIY and 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 it's like a screw that's not quite coming out, I get particularly annoyed and angry so presumably those sort of things happen all the time if you were trying to you know settle mars <laughs> maybe yeah, maybe i'm not psychologically cut out for martian yeah one long diy project because it's almost literally a machine for living in because it, it's in it's your life support system surrounding you all the time so you can't afford to just kick it and uh, get cross with it you've got to nurture it and care for it in a different way so i think that that's the overlap with the well-being aspects that i'm really interested in is how your relationship to the home and its material and spaces has oh. to become so intimate because because it's so critical for your survival yeah it's really interesting isn't it that that idea of if you took it to different you know particularly sort of very different countries like you said japan or nigeria or somewhere like that and you took it to places like that how it would end up looking and, and would it be anywhere near similar to? What yeah, we've got I in mean, Bristol? I would find that very exciting thing to do. 
especially thinking about what we do after this. We've spent six years on the project so far. And so thinking what we do next, it would be nice to, to do it and keep on. If you if you got, say, 10 of them, you could average it all out so everyone would be unhappy. <laughs> that, that's a principle that the architect's profession has applied for, for, for centuries. <laughs> the, the modular man, the average universal person, yep. which has afflicted architecture for, for for a long time. That's what you get. Slightly less than two eyes. Right. So, uh, well, well, thanks very much for, 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 for coming on. It's a, it's a, it is a really interesting project. I love the, I love the open ended question about it and the, the fact that it's sort of stepped outside of the normal analogs that you see. I think it's, it's, I, I can't wait to, I can't wait to come and visit. It's actually not too far oh, away from yeah, where I live. Yeah, let us know when you come down if you want, <laughs> if you want a tour. Yeah. Interesting no, combination of, arts and architecture combines really Great. interesting guys so thanks Thank a lot you. actually before you go what what's the best place for people to kind of look at the to go and look at the project and and find out about it so we've got twitter instagram facebook building a martian house if people want to join them then that's going to be really up to date news and and when we're doing stuff we'll be posting so people can see and then we've got a website Ella and Nikki.com and it's Nikki N I C K I. The Interplanetary Podcast, putting the ace back into space. Well, there we go. That that I thought that was really interesting, and I thought that there's definitely some bits that we need to talk about. Yeah. From, so, <laughs> from that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> there was some there's some moment that, now for me, and this this goes back to this Nexus Aurora, is there are people that want to everyone's always continually trying to put their image their their kind of world view on on what they believe is a fresh start yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like it's not a fresh start at all because it's it's carrying your baggage that you're not even seeing as baggage and i thought that that, that came across in nexus aurora and really in that interview as well i thought yeah very much so and uh, i think what that interview suggested was that this project might offer a more open framework to people for people to bring ideas to the table, uh, both in the way it was developed through the workshops that they've undertaken and, and, and described. But the idea they were describing around uh, it being unfinished and people have to comment and input on it, I thought was 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 a really interesting one. But they seem to have constraints on that discussion. Yeah, tensions. And Nexus Aurora had the same restraint as well, that that um, no nuclear power. I think so, yeah. In the report for Nexus Aurora, they seem to suggest that they believe uh, solar energy alone is sufficient with very large fields of thin film solar uh, panels rolled out across the landscape. And they talk about avoiding the geopolitics of a nuclear launch and getting material to to Mars, which I thought was a, a pretty bold position to take. So it's interesting to to see that uh, come up again in that discussion between the artist and the architect. There, with the Nexus Aurora, you could uh, that there was there there. I guess is you could put that down to practicality. Yeah, but in but definitely in that in the Mars house, it was an ideological viewpoint, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was. It, it was. It, uh, it, it it was a question about the environment, which I thought was interesting because it makes you think differently about the Martian environment and about how perhaps we should treat it uh, more preciously uh, and take more care over it, which I think is the, was, was the, the artist's position, her instinct, uh, probably yeah. informed by the, uh, the workshop discussions of the public she'd had as well. Um, and her point about, uh, again, about uh, what was the phrase she used? Uh, uh, do we need to have all the answers? So that question about space for ambiguity again. I mm. thought was very interesting too. Do we need to have oh. all the energy answers when we first arrive? I mean, most engineers would was, was, was reel in horror at that and say, well, absolutely, yes, we do. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's quite funny because I always perceive architects as being somewhere between engineers and artists. <laughs> so you are the, the sort of halfway people. You've got the engineers who really are only concerned with how does this bit of metal fit yeah. with this metal and is it the right way of doing it and will it last? Yeah. Yeah, and then you've got the artists who who want to who who only want to talk about the human experience of that yeah. particular thing, and then you've got the architects that bridge the gap. Is is that actually a fair way of seeing the trade of architects? Yeah, I, I don't think so. So, so the, the the arrogant amongst us would say that we are both artists and engineers, 
the humble amongst us would might suggest that we just have enough skills to be able to mediate between those two positions mm. um, uh, rather than fully uh, fully embrace the skills required to, to, to be either of those. Do you think that Elon Musk could perhaps do with a little bit more artistry in his life? I mean, I know he's married to an artist. Yeah, <laughs> he, he, but... he is. And, and it was certainly interesting to see between them the carbon emissions uh, question between NFT sales and uh, rocket launches on the same day uh, last week. Well, the week, yeah, that... the week before, was it? I can't recall now. Yeah, it was the week before. That was definitely a crazy day for the Musk family, it was, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Yeah. Grimes selling three and a half million quids worth of NFTs and everyone going, what the hell's an NFT? Yeah. And then <laughs> and then Elon Musk landing a... I mean, landing but, a you, you might, you might argue that there, there is artistry already in the SpaceX model because the the, the drive that, that he brought to that, that organisation uh, for his goal and aspiration to land on Mars comes from a place of perhaps artistry and poetry and human aspiration more than it does just engineering desire perhaps perhaps yeah it's it, it's always hard to tell with musk isn't yeah. it i mean there's he's he's infuriating to try and really <laughs> i think i think he does i genuinely think he 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 wants to make humans inter interplanetary and and it's you know he he fears for humanity and all those things but sometimes he actually forgets the humanity of it yes i think that's a very good it's, summary which, actually yeah it's very odd, isn't yeah. it? And and I think I think actually there's hints of that as we as we go through looking at those plans. It's it's been absolutely ace having you on, Rob, because it's it's really nice to have a look at uh, uh, subjects through someone else's expertise. Thank you. I've, re- I've really enjoyed it, and, and it's also been interesting as a podcast experience. Is that I I, I normally have to express myself with drawings. <laughs> you know, when I'm when I'm teaching, I'm doing it yeah. by the end of a pencil as I'm talking. So to, to do it in a podcast environment has been been good fun. So what's next week? Next week, Lynn's back no. by popular Fantastic. demand. Fantastic. Uh, and we're, just, we're going to talk about Mars science. That sounds amazing. We were all bowled over by Lynn in that episode. Yeah, Lynn's great. Lynn, yeah, Lynn, Lynn's really great. And and she brought up, she's got the best microphone, annoyingly. Yeah. See, she's even outbeat me on the microphone. Yeah, don't rub that in. I've had enough grief with microphones this week. <laughs> I hope this one's been all right. It just goes to show that you can that that you never know if something's going to bite you. <laughs> <laughs> going to Mars and you've got a billion things that can go wrong. Yeah, that that's that's the thing. I should have just I, embraced I, the ambiguity. Trust me, I've had the the most technologically demanding day of all time today. Have you? <laughs> I've been trying to make a video for 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 the college, and every time I've been doing it, that the camera's out of focus for some bizarre reason, or my phone kept crashing and I was sort of videoing it on both. So both had to be working, but most of the time, one of them wasn't. Nice. It was like the opposite situation of redundancy. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure as a species, we're ready to go to Mars. The, when I can get a home printer that, that works, yep. then then we're ready to go to Mars. But that seems to be getting further away. It, it, it does. It does. That, that, that Twitter meme of that starts, hear me out. XXX. The best one I ever saw was, hear me out, a printer, but it works. Actually, I think I absolutely put that, that meme to bed, <laughs> to be honest. We're going to put the show notes up. Uh, and as uh, Rob promised, he's going to very, very nicely stick his um, a link out to his um, his own entry yeah. to uh, the Mars Society. So uh, wh- do you know where you know where the uh, website is, Rob? Interplanetary.org.uk. Yes. Indeed. And of course, if you want to be like Rob and join us on the Discord, and I do, I've got a feeling that we should definitely boil up this idea of the interplanetary Discord coming up with an entry for the uh, the next time one of these Mars things comes around. It's, it would be amazing. It's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a so, lot of work. Lot of but work. I think we've got some great spodcats, though. There's some great spodcats. Yeah, we have in the got mix. quite a team. So it could be pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That you can find at patreon.com forward slash interplanetary. And uh, next week I'll be thanking people like Rob. <laughs> uh, next week in the in the in in next week's show, which is with Lynn. So uh, we'll see you then. Bye bye, Spudcats! Bye. bye.